Many of you have taken me up on my invitation uh, to ask you to send me uh, your desires in terms of the subjects of the words of Jesus that are difficult. And by far, the vast majority of you who have sent those notes have asked specifically about what did Jesus mean when he said, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. And uh, I looked at that and I said, this is what you call stomp the preacher. <laughs> but I will, I will attempt to do that today. So I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 10, beginning at verse 34. Matthew 10, 34. We normally kind of get into the message, into the text after an introduction, but there really is not much of an introduction with a text like that. It's very clear. But I want to explain to you, and we spend a little time looking at this text and what did Jesus really mean by those words. Let me invite you to stand up with me as we read the Word of God together. The Gospel according to Matthew chapter 10, verses 34, 35, and 36. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, as if they need any help. <laughs> a man's enemy will be the members of his household. Not so long ago, two things happened that kind of crystallized some of my thinking here. A young man was telling me about a ministry with which he became associated, and one of the first things they said to him when he joined the ministry said, do not say that you're a Christian. Reason. The word Christianity is misunderstood by a lot of people. Sometimes Christianity has a negative connotation to a whole lot of people. So they said to him, you can say that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ if you're asked. And even so, when you offer Jesus, just offer him as a friend, period. Within a matter of weeks, a friend of mine was telling me about a memo that was issued by a pastor in a very large evangelical church. And it says to the staff, here are the don'ts, the words that you should not mention, the terminologies, the, the, you know, we, I know I'm aware of the, the difficulty that we Christians kind of use Christianese and people from outside do not really understand, we almost like speak a different language. So it is understandable when that memo came to the staff and they said to them, you do not use the word born again or saved from sin or hell or damnation or eternal judgment and eternal punishment. Just do not use these words at all. But I want to share with you on a personal level. This is on a personal level now, not on a pastoral level, but on a personal level, the anguish that I personally have felt, my personal observation understanding all that I understand and knowing all that I know and I have experienced in the first 19 years of my life. And I'm not even asking you to experience what I'm experiencing or feel what I feel. But this is a phenomenon that seems to be going across the board in our nation. And I'm merely telling you of my own inner anguish at the condition in which I find ourselves as a culture. And it's not surprising, therefore, it's not astonishing to me that before Jesus goes to verse 34 to talk about he did not come to bring peace but a sword, he begins in verse 32 by saying, whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whosoever disowns me before man, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. You see, before Jesus can talk about peace, he had to talk about acknowledging him before men. What does it mean to acknowledge Jesus before men? I want you to listen carefully, please. It is far more than just to say, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. It is more than claiming to be a follower of Jesus Christ, particularly if it is beneficial to my business and business dealings. 
It is far more to just recognize some truth about Christianity and about Christ and subscribe to those truths. It is far more than that. To acknowledge Jesus publicly means that I am not embarrassed to confess that Jesus Christ means everything to me. To acknowledge Jesus Christ publicly means that He is my only Lord and Savior. Even at the risk of ridicule, even at the risk of financial loss, and yes, even at the risk of physical injury. Does that mean that if a believer has lapsed in his or her faithfulness and at some point denied their faith, that God will not forgive them? Is it the unforgivable sin? Absolutely not. Peter denied the Lord Jesus Christ three times, and when he repented, the Lord Jesus Christ not only forgave him, but he restored him. Timothy was a great leader in the church, and apparently he became politically correct, and he was trying to kind of please different groups in the church. And apparently he became reluctant about openly and boldly proclaim the gospel out of fear. Listen to what the Apostle Paul writes to him and says, 2 Timothy 1.8, So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord. But beloved, I want to tell you there is a world of difference between lapsing and continuously being embarrassed about the Lord Jesus. It is a world of difference because God always forgives lapsers. God always is ready to restore lapsers. God is always more than ready to in, engulf us into His arms when we repent and turn to Him. And that is why Jesus warns us. He said, I did not come to bring peace but a sword on the earth. Isn't that a contradiction? Not at all, my friend, but I can understand. Many times I try to put myself in the place of somebody who really does not believe. I try to put myself in somebody who's reading the Bible and really has not understood what the gospel is all about and begin to read these things. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. If I was not a committed disciple of Jesus Christ, I would say, wait a minute, I don't want this. Wouldn't you? I mean, it, it does. I mean, if I did not acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Savior of my soul and the Lord of my life, and I would, if I've heard these words just spoken or read in the Bible, I wouldn't want to be a Christian. I mean, my attitude would be, man, the world is full of swords. I'm looking for peace. I would say, the world is full of hatred and anger. I'm looking for peace in my life and in my family. The, the, to, to so many people that they are weary and they're stressed out and they're looking for that inner peace. Just about everyone I know wants that peace that doesn't make sense to the world. So once again, if that is the case, what does Jesus mean by saying, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword? You see, if you take the words of Jesus in this verse at face value, you have to conclude that this is the worst marketing endeavor of all times. I mean, surely. <laughs> This is not, I mean, this is not a good salesman here. I mean, Jesus couldn't be a very, very good motivational speaker. <laughs> Surely, he's not winning friends and influencing people by saying those words. But of course, these words have nothing to do with the inner peace that only Jesus Christ can give you and give me. They have nothing to do with that inner peace that is only possible when you come in surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Has nothing to do with that inner peace. It's far from contradiction. I'm going to show you in a minute that far from the Bible being contradictory, it is consistent. If you take those words at face value, 
you'll have trouble. But then you have to understand how Semitic people talk. <laughs> you have to understand how a Semitic language is framed and how that language, because it really, that's where a lot of people get off on the wrong track. When they do not understand how it's this put together, how the language of the day, how the language of the time, and how the culture in which the Bible is born. You've got to understand it. Jesus was speaking to his disciples who have already experienced that inner peace that he gave them. Jesus was speaking to the disciples who never knew an inner peace, a peace of knowing that they are forgiven and they are on their way to heaven until they met Jesus. You've got to understand, he's talking to them. And therefore, they understood that he was not speaking about that inner peace that only Jesus could give. He was talking about another type of peace, an outward peace. I'm going to come and explain it in a minute. Jesus was preparing them to understand that the very gospel of peace that they have received, that brought them inner peace, is going to be rejected by others. Jesus was preparing them that the very gospel of peace that reconciled us sinners to a holy God, only Jesus Christ can do that. They understood that this is the peace that Jesus gives. They understood that he was not talking about this. He, they understood that the very gospel of peace that they have accepted, that they have received, is going to be rejected by others. And those who reject the gospel of peace will also reject the proclaimers of that peace. They will reject the proclaimers of that gospel. And that very act of rejection of the gospel of peace by some will bring conflict and disharmony between them and those who have accepted it. You see, it's the outward peace, not the inner peace. But you know what? This especially, especially going to be felt if those who have rejected the peace of God are the nearest and the dearest to us. And that's what Jesus is warning them about. I'm going to give you a personal testimony, a personal example of what I mean. In 1997, I was invited in Washington, D.C. by a very large conser politically conservative group, organization, very prominent. They invited me to come and give the invocation. I was, not, I was a little bit concerned if they really knew me well enough to ask me to do something dangerous like that. I asked the president the morning of that meeting, and I said, are you sure you're ready for me? <laughs> he blissfully said, oh, yes, we are ready for you. I said, okay. So I got up and prayed. And when I finished praying, I said, very simply, I pray this in the matchless, powerful, and glorious name of my Lord Jesus Christ. And by the time I said amen, I could literally hear the crackling of the ice all over the room. It was so unbelievable. Unless you've been in a situation like this, you will not understand what I'm trying to tell you. Finally, I came and I took my seat on one of the head tables, and there was a man at the table. He was so angry, his face was red. I mean, literally. Believe me, he was gritting his teeth, and I try to be as nice as ingratiating, you know, sometimes. <laughs> and his silence, as they say, was, 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 was profane. <laughs> and, and, and finally, he grit his teeth, and he said, why did you have to mention that name? Well, I smiled again. I said, what name? What name? I wanted to pronounce that name. <laughs> but he wouldn't. I discovered later that he is one of the big funders of that organization. And I'm sure the president will never have me back. As gently 
and as lovingly. I was torn on the inside. God knows the truth of what I'm telling you. I was torn on the inside. I didn't want this to happen. I didn't want necessarily to, but I tried to explain to him what that name means to me and how that name saved my life. And that name means everything to me, and I'm even willing to die for that name. Well, he softened a little bit, but I cannot proclaim to you that I led him to the Lord. But you know, in itself, that taught me a lesson, really is. It taught me, and the very fact that I even remember it today, <laughs> is obviously left an indelible mark on my mind and on my heart. It, it, because it caused me unsettlement. It, 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 look, I'm a human being. I want to be liked like everybody else. I want to be accepted like everybody else. I want to be loved like everybody else. I'm not, I'm not made of ice. But it caused me unsettlement. It, it, it caused disturbance in my spirit. And obviously, it caused him anger, and I really didn't want this to happen. It's the last thing I want to see, but, and it took away that peace. It may have existed. It divided me from him and vice versa. Did I ever regret that? Not on your life. Would I have changed what I said? Not for a moment. Would I do it again? In a minute. But there is no denying of the fact that this kind of confrontation can skew our peace and cause us unsettlement. And that is exactly what Jesus is talking about. Let me even magnify it for you so you can see it. <laughs> At the end of the night, he went his way, I went my way. But imagine if this person was dear and near to me. Imagine if father or a mother or brother or sister or son or daughter, imagine if somebody that I'm living with day in and day out. Just imagine that I am with that person every single day. Imagine if this were somebody that's near and dear to me. I can only imagine, I can only imagine, because I really, really, really cannot imagine it properly. I can imagine living under such circumstances. What with constant discord, with constant anger, and with constant snickering and bickering, with constant needling. Now, Jesus had already given me inner peace. He's already given you, if you're a believer in Him, He's, he's given you inner peace, and no one can take that away from you. Now, regardless of the environment in which you live, regardless of the circumstances in which you live, regardless of the relationship that you have, nobody can take away that inner peace that Jesus gives you. Amen. Nobody can take that away. But nonetheless, the outer peace has been disturbed. This is the kind of sort of separation between those who know the peace of God that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ and those who have rejected the peace of God. That's what Jesus is talking about. That's the meaning of this verse. Let me tell you about what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I don't want you to misunderstand me. But it's a very powerful thing, and to be truthful to the Word of God, I have to point you to this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the Apostle Paul, who has been called to minister to the Gentiles who are coming to Christ, did not have the Jewish Scripture, did not have the background, did not have Abraham, did not have the covenant. They're brand new, coming into the kingdom. One member of the family becomes a Christian and the other isn't. One spouse becomes a Christian, the other spouse does not. And here's what the Apostle Paul is telling them. He said, if the unbelieving spouse, hear me right, if the unbelieving spouse is willing to live with the believing spouse, then rejoice and stay married. If the unbelieving spouse says, I can't live with that, I don't want this Jesus of yours, he said, don't hold on to him or her. Let him go. That's what the Apostle Paul said here. Do you know why? Verse 15 gives you the answer. First, verse 15 
of 1 Corinthians 7, for the sake of the peace of the believer. For the believer's peace. So when Jesus speaks of his coming not to bring peace, is the Semitic way, listen to me please, this is the Semitic way of saying, this is the Semitic way of expressing what's going to happen to us, what's going to be done to us by those who are going to reject the peace that Jesus gives. They will cause us temporary loss of our outward peace, not our inward peace. They will cause us a temporary loss of our outward joy, not inner joy. They will cause us a, a, a temporary loss of our outward serenity. And so what does it, this mean to us? Those of us who love the Lord and those of us who trusted him with our salvation and him alone. Not him plus our works, just him alone. What does this do to us? There are some people who think that should mean that believers should get into a huddle and ignore everybody else outside of the church. That is not what, the, in fact, 1 Corinthians again. When Paul tells the believers to break fellowship from the believer who is deliberately carnal and sinful, he said, but don't ever break fellowship with the unbelievers. Why? Because we are the light. We are what God is going to use to bring them to himself. Because Jesus is a sword that divides. Because Jesus is a sword that cuts. It does not mean that we walk away from the unbelieving member of the family. It does not mean that we walk away from the unbelieving friend. It does not mean that we walk away from the unbelieving neighbor or coworker. Not in a million years. We keep on loving. We keep on giving. We keep on ministering. We keep on serving. We keep on reaching out. And I'm going to tell you why. The rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say, which is the rest of the passage of 1 Corinthians. The reason if an unbelieving family member wants to stay, keep them, he said, because the unbelieving spouse is sanctified in the believing spouse. What does that mean? It means that when God reaches down and brings a family member to himself, it means that in the economy of God and in the economy of heaven, God has a plan for the whole family. And don't walk out on it. It means... And in fact, let me stick my neck all the way out so some of you would chop it. That if God has placed someone in, on your heart to pray for fervently and consistently, it's an indication that God has a plan for that person and your prayer is part of God's plan for that person. So in humility, we love everyone, even those who hate us, those who criticize us, those who reject us, we keep on loving them and we keep on reaching to them. The cost of, our, of the disturbance of our outward peace is nothing in comparison to the joy when you see them come to Christ. Nothing in comparison. You know, there may be someone here today. You've been invited to come with a friend. And you know that friend is praying for you and that friend loves you. And you're seeing that inner peace in that friend. And you say, I wish I could have that inner peace. The reason I'm here in a church today is because I am looking, I'm searching. I want, I want that inner peace in my life. It can be yours today, this very moment. It is yours for the asking. God does not do anything including bringing you to this place by accident. He brought you here for a purpose because he wants to give you that inner peace that nobody can take away from you regardless of your outward circumstances and all you can do is we pray say lord jesus christ come into my life forgive my sins give me that peace that inner peace that no one can take away 
If you'd like to learn how to know God in a personal way, ask for the booklet, Finding the Joy You've Always Wanted. It will tell you of God's love for you and explain how to experience His forgiveness. have a personal relationship with God and you're interested in walking closer with Him, the booklet Seven Steps in Your Faith Adventure will help guide you into a deeper fellowship with your Heavenly Father. Ask for your free booklet 